You're listening to After No War, broadcasting from the beautiful South Berlin. Except no substitute. Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to Achtung Millwall, number one Millwall podcast. It's the Neil and Nick's History Hour. The February fixtures loom in front of us for the next well, hour or so. But first of all, I want to say a huge welcome back. He is back. I, I should have that um, I'm Back in New York City song playing, but it'll probably break copyright. Big welcome back to the, the man himself, Neil Fistler. How are you, mate? Not too bad, Nick. Not too bad. It's great to be back. And I think when we went on, I'm back. You're back. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would... hiatus. Yes, let's, let's, let's draw a hospital curtain around the hiatus for you, shall we? Um, it's just great oh. to see you back on the show, mate. Um, yeah, no, I feel a lot better. A lot better. Good. Got one or two things sorted out. Great to hear, mate. Um, we are here, as I've said already, to look at Millwall's fixtures, a particularly packed February now. Actually, I, I, I opened up the, um, the the BBC's fixture um, planner for for Millwall, and I thought, blimey, a short month. We've got seven fixtures to get through this today between us. It's um, it's quite tight, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I thought, oh well, yeah. We'll have four fixtures to do. Looked on the front of the see you we were playing, and there's seven. I thought, oh. <laughs> Oh God! Thank, thank you, COVID. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not sure I can sit for that long. <laughs> no, I'm not sure I can talk about Mill for that long, listeners. But <laughs> I'm sure we can. We, we, I don't know how many hundreds of shows we've done there, so we can talk about it. My wife is endlessly fascinated by the amount of conversation that flows from a relatively small football club. <laughs> but there we are. Um, so we have seven fixtures to get through. Neil, first up is um, next Tuesday. Mill playing Preston at home. Shall I begin? Shall I kick us off with my, my yeah, choice? Yeah, go on, man. Yeah, well, I picked out a nice one for Preston. I've well. picked out one from 1973, listeners, and the day before my birthday, I was 13 the day after this 5-1 win for the Lions over Preston North End. Um, I don't know if I was there. I might have been. I might not have been. I was, I was quite young for midweek football at the den back then. Um, but this, I do remember... One incident, this is a 5-1 win for Lions, a hat-trick for a great striker, Neil Alfwood, um, one of my favourite all-time strikers in a, in a, in a Millwall shirt. Uh, and this was a night for, of a hat-trick for, for Alfie. And also goals for uh, Brian Clark and I believe it's Steve Brown. I'm just looking at the, the – I've got a match report here from the, the Daily Mirror – I'm going to read it, if I may. Um, Alf is on target as Mill showed Bobby, and that Bobby, listeners, is Bobby Cholton, who was managing Preston. And the incident that I remember, was, I think it might be from another Preston game, if, if not a midweek, but a Saturday fixture, was he was, act, he was applauded along the, the touchline. Um, Jack Cholton was applauded when he came managing um, Middlesbrough. And Bobby Cholton received an ovation from the Mill support as he walked along pre-match um to the to the uh the, the trainers dugouts very very few managers um i can't think of many others clough i think is the only other one that springs to mind received an ovation um helped i suppose by the fact that we've beaten 5-1 afterwards because he wasn't a terribly good manager bobby charlton there was he no great player pretty yeah. average manager and i think he quite acknowledged it in the end didn't he i think he didn't he he took over Preston North End when he left Manchester United. I think he took a certain knobby Styles with him. He did because Styles was playing. Um, I think it might be a fixture after this, but um, certainly Styles was playing in the game that I did see when when um, Bobby Chant was applauded out. Um, and obviously both <laughs> World Cup winning players. Yeah, but I think he realised it. His life was more towards business at that end because he became a very successful businessman. I think he had a travel agency. Didn't he have a soccer school, the Bobby Charlton Soccer School? You probably yeah. remember that from the... From yeah. The late 70s. Yeah, there's not many people get a standing ovation. I can only think of Paul Merson down the new ground. I can't think of very many others. Well, Merson got that after an absolutely masterful display. I think it was to Pompey, wasn't it? They beat us 5-0 yeah, right. at home. And it was um, like Gascoigne, Neil. Um, Merson on fire. Gascoigne was on fire when, when Spurs beat us back in the in the first division days. And one thing you've got to take your hat off to the Mill crowd, and, you know, it's, it's much maligned in the media, but they do, when they see um, a different level, they will acknowledge it. And I think Gascoigne and, um, and, and Merson will attest to that because both received... 
good applause off the pitch, despite destroying us on, on both occasions. Um, but yeah, Bobby Charlton managing Preston in this 5-1 loss. I, I was um, five, it struck me, Brian Clark was a great uh, striker. But I haven't got your book to hand, your, your who's who book. I should have brought it upstairs and I've left it downstairs. So I haven't got his numbers, listeners. But Brian Clark, I think, came to us via Cardiff City, Neil, if memory serves. He does. And I, I, funnily enough, I was going to make mention of him in the Cardiff City. Uh, OK. We'll come back to him in that case. Yeah. But, well, I'll do it anyway. He scored 20 goals in 84 appearances. Joined us from Bournemouth. I think he's actually... Bournemouth, was it? From Bournemouth. I think he went to Cardiff, Bournemouth, yeah. and then back to Cardiff again. Of course, he's actually famous for being the first goal scorer on a Sunday. That's right. Yeah. Right against Fulham. A game that I was at. Um, 11.30 kickoff, and we kicked off before everybody else in this newfangled experiment called Sunday football. Quite revolutionary in its in its day. I remember yeah, feeling well, really, really strange to be travelling up from Mottingham up to up to New Cross on a Sunday morning. Everything. This was an era, listeners, where Sunday meant things were shut and it was quiet. Not now. Definitely shut. The paper shop opened for about three hours in the morning, that and then it. that was it. Your supermarket wasn't open. If you didn't have anything, you went hungry. There were no takeaways. <laughs> there were no anything back in that back in those days, were there? No, different era. I mean, it, it sounds like Charles Dickens this time when you say this to youngsters, and often they, they think, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was the way it was. And less traffic on the roads. It was quiet. Sunday was quiet, and it certainly wasn't a football day. Um, but yeah, you're right. Brian Clark scored. I think he scored a famous goal for Cardiff, Neil. In um, was it a cup winners' cup win over someone like Inter Milan or AC Milan, one of the Italian clubs? Real Madrid, thinking? possibly. Real Madrid, Real Madrid. Um, good striker, great striker. But I, I've picked out Alf, big Alf Wood, one of my favourite strikers. A great the striker story. as well. To be fair, Alf Wood wasn't he? I think you speak absolutely. To... You, you speak to the older generation on Hoff, and Alf Wood is in those hollow tones, isn't he? he? Sadly, sadly, actually died two or three years ago of dementia. I think he was suffering with dementia, which is very sad yeah, way awful, to, to finish your life. Um, yeah, 115 appearances for Alf Wood. I picked these figures out as, as, on my notes here. Yeah, 45 goals from 115 appearances, 1972-75 for Millwall. Um, I think he moved on to Middlesbrough after us. He played for Manchester City, and I think he made a Wembley appearance in his late um, period with Stafford Rangers. And I think it might have been an FA Trophy final, winning um, the trophy at Wembley, I believe. Yeah, quite ironically, I think he ended up running a uh, he ended up running a sports shop and trophy business, and actually supplied the trophies for a lot of uh, the football league finals. Did he? I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't know that. Great player, rugged. Um, he came in when we we'd lost Barry Bridges, and I think Posse was looking to get out of the club. And I think the the intention of Benny Fenton when Alf signed was that it was going to be a, a Posse and Alfwood duo, which never really worked out. But that would have been some some strike force in an effort to shoot our way back to Division One contention. That never happened either. But. Um, Alf Wood, yeah, take my hat off to him. He was he was a great striker. So that's my choice of Preston fixture, Neil, from 1973. What, what what did you go for, mate? Did you have one? I've gone for the I've gone for a home game. It was on the fourth of October, 1930. So wow. I've gone back to a time when you remember very well, Nick. <laughs> I'm going to ignore this because he's, he's been a sick man, listeners. I'm going to ignore these little <laughs> jibes. <laughs> it was a game that finished Millwall 5, Preston North End 7. 5-7? Five, 5-7 seven. Five, wow. five, seven at home. Gary Rowett would be having a stroke, <laughs> wouldn't he, by now? <laughs> I'm going to have to look this one up as you're talking. Yeah, that's, that's some scoreline. So, to score 5 and get beat, I mean, you know, it's um, that's incredible. Uh, our goal scorers were Jimmy Poxton got two. Uh, he was an outside left who had actually had an England try when he was at West Brom. Scored under, uh, played 156 games, scored 35 goals for us. Was actually a bit of a penalty taker. Scored 12 penalties wow. after taking his time to break into the team. And actually, later in life, won a British Empire medal. So we've actually got somebody with a well, with an initial. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I know that Danny Baker or 
or somebody thought it was quite good that we had a sir playing for us. Didn't somebody hit us up on Twitter after they got my book? And so George Roby, yeah, that's they were right. Yeah. About George Roby, weren't they? So we've had a couple of of OBEs, MBEs, and British Empire medals, but the. Uh, uh, Jimmy Forsyth, I think we spoke about him a couple of times. We've he mentioned his name. Me. I've just found the fixture. There it is, as you say, rightly nil. It's in 19, 1930. Um, 4th of October, 1930. I'm just looking at Mill's results going into I mean, we had one win, a 5-1 win, incidentally, listeners. Otherwise, we've got beat uh, 2-1 the following week. 5-7, we're talking about here against Preston. The week before, 4-1. Um, I mean, as you say, Gary Rowe would be, would be a fit, wouldn't he? With a losing track record, shipping goals on that, on that. But also the seemingly the strange ability to score goals. When we win, there's a four 0 win there, knocking around in September against Reading. We seem to score big, so it's a very odd combination. Unpredictability. Yeah, I think it was the kind of time where, where, where there are a lot of goals in games, weren't there? Well, quite obviously, that's probably stating the obvious, but we had quite well, a decent. We had Duncan Uly in goal, Sid Sweetman, Jimmy Pipe, Lem Newcomb, Billy Bryant, who was a... We've England mentioned his name before. Yeah, yep. yeah. A number of times, haven't we? Jimmy Forsyth, yeah. Harold Wadsworth, Joe Reedman, Jack Cock, Les Smith and Jimmy Poxton. So not a bad not a bad thing. But to have someone like Billy Bryant in there, who was an England amateur international, played yeah. for Clapton, I think, in a couple of FA Amateur Cup finals. So... Under the management of um, dear Bob Hunter, who we've um, recently, thank, um, I'm really pleased to announce, we've been able to arrange a plaque for it on the on the wall when, whenever it gets fitted. I, I think that may be later on this year for that, the, the memorial plaque for, for Bill um, Bob Hunter. And this would have been under the, the kind of last couple of seasons of his management. So one of the great names of, of the mill. That's a, that's a fantastic result. I mean, to, <laughs> to score we run five. Lovely, apparently. We run yeah. lucky, according to the Sunday Mirror. Really? So it's not often that, a spect- uh, that the spectators at New Cross have the pleasure of seeing 12 goals scored during a match. Tell me about it. Probably dampened <laughs> a trifle by the fact that Millwall scored five, yet were beaten by Preston North End with seven. The home side, however, may regard themselves as unlucky in losing. Well, you let in seven. I don't think you're looking. No, you're going to you've got to take your medicine there, Neil, haven't you? Um, I do. <laughs> I, I do. Four five. You don't expect to lose, do you? Really? I think. You know, I think it's summed up quite I nicely do. about that game. It must have been absolutely a mad game. Fourteen thousand there, and, and a couple of hundred. Um, I do like the florid, florid, you know, the kind of flowing style of the old school journalists, uh, listeners. I'm, I'm, as, as I've got a journalist on the on the phone right now with me, I'm going to sort of urge him to up his up his rugby reporting in the same style, Long, longer words and more florid, you know, flowery style of language. No need to reply, Mister Fisler. Okay, we're going to move along. <laughs> um, for the next game along in uh, February's Fulham fixture, which we're all anticipating might be another seven goal. <laughs> Eight goal <laughs> <laughs> fixture, <laughs> not necessarily with us scoring so many, but there we are. We'll we'll see. We'll keep our fingers crossed and live on in hope. Um, but anyway, the the Fulham fixture I've picked out was one I was at um, 28th of December. I remember going to this one distinctly. 1976, Fulham two, Mill three at Craven Cottage. Um, I went there. Um, actually, I wasn't expecting a, 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 you know, much out of the game, but we we a final way win. Reason it sticks in my memory is that Fulham at that time were quite a glamorous side. They they um, signed Rod, Rodney Marsh, George Best, of course, Bobby Moore, and I believe Alan yeah. Mallory was was playing. So I mean, I went as much in expectation of um, seeing some of these great great players, but as it was, this was a fine away performance. Um, I'm just going to read out the Mill team, if I may. Neil uh, Ray Goddard in goal, Dave Donaldson, Barry Kitchener, Tony Hazel. There was a great, great kind of defensive um, midfield stroke defender. Ray Evans, we've mentioned a few times, great, great um, right back. Trevor Lee, John Moore, Phil Walker, Barry Fairbrother, um, and a player I'd forgotten, um, Pat Sharkey up front, and John Seisman. Um, 3 2 win for the Lions. And I, got, I couldn't find much in the way of reporting. It was a Christmas fixture, so there was no report in any of the daily papers that I could find. But I did find a, a paragraph or two of all um, papers from the Bel- Belfast Telegraph on the 29th. 
Um, and saying that George Best, Rodney Marsh and, and Jerry Payton, another Fulham player, are all doubtful because of injuries. I think they've been on the, the Christmas um on the, on the Christmas lash, personally, that was my yeah, my theory. Out with George Best, didn't they? <laughs> um, Fulham will, will wait to see the report from referee John Homewood uh, before deciding whether to support George Best in an appeal for leniency when he faces a disciplinary request. Not like Bestie to have a disciplinary um, hearing. He's booked apparently at Chelsea. Chelsea back then were a second division side, and he got himself <clears throat> he reached 20, 20 points from a booking against Chelsea. Um, strange period in, I mean, Jeff Best was, I'm glad to say I've seen him play where he was way, way past his, his, um, his heyday when he played at the Den, which would be, I think in the kind of spring of that season, 76, 77, he did play, but he was well past his, his, his pomp. But for me, Neil, I don't know how you feel about George Best, a genius. Um, I mean, my, my experience of him is on TV, of course, but, um, Perhaps the most talented player these islands have ever produced. Well, how do you see him? I think I I I wouldn't actually disagree with that. It's a shame that he kind of went off the rails because the mind boggles at what the man could have achieved. Absolutely magnificent yeah. footballer. And yeah, I did see him play. I saw him actually play for Fulham. I think I must have been reporting. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, so, it was, it... and just the buzz that George Best was playing. Along with absolutely, yeah. there was another great player of that era, Maverick players, weren't they? The kind of players that you'd kill to have in the game. Now, I think, I think that what with press officers and player liaison managers and God knows what else, they probably wouldn't go down so well. <laughs> would they? But, but, but what great players! It always sticks in my memory watching. George Best on a muddy pitch. I think it was against Northampton Town. Famous, famous, yeah. Yeah, and I was a huge fan, knee, fan of his. Knee deep in mud and just a skill to control the ball and do with it on those pitches what you wanted was absolutely unbelievable, my player. I think, I mean, I, I, I've listened to a podcast from a, a few years ago where they interviewed Chris Waddle and he made a similar point to the one I'm going to make now about Best. Um, he learned his trade, Waddle, I'm talking about playing um, as a kid, as a 14-year-old, playing men in pub football. So he, he, he basically advocated it as a means of learning how to ride a tackle, how to, how to, he would take the mickey out of blokes in a sense that he would put the ball through their legs, he could do stuff. And then they would <laughs> come after him because they, they'd been humiliated by this kid, you know. Um, but he said you learn to um, hold yourself and and to ride a sack. And I think that George Best, who was quite a slight player, really, when you when you see those old old um, images of him. But again, I mean, kicking a player was quite part was quite part of the game. That's what I had to ha- you know you had to be able to handle that, and he did. But it's fascinating to see the football of that time. It, it is familiar and yet so different to to what is accepted now. And he actually had some cracking wives and girlfriends as well. Oh, God, <laughs> yeah. Where did it all go wrong? Famous joke, and you know, where did it all go wrong? All right. I mean, Rodney Marsh was actually the one I picked out because I think mean, Best was probably an obvious choice. And he, you know, Best for me, uh, it was a, uh, I was actually a member of the George Best fan club, listeners, as a kid. It was before Millwall, before I became a Millwall fan. Um, because he was just such a, 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 a compelling um, player. And a personality, probably the first personality player that we'd really seen in the modern era in, in, in football. But um, Rodney Marsh is just a, a fascinating character, born in, um, well, he's brought up in the East End, actually, Neil, and um, made his name with QPR. But in a similar way, I mean, I best had league championships and the European Cup medal, but Marsh never seemed to quite fulfil his potential because he was a great player. He was a, he was a very, very flamboyant and um, imaginative midfielder come striker, wasn't he? Yeah, never played for the big clubs at the time, did he? Although QPR, uh, just what, they missed out on goal difference one year, didn't they, to Liverpool or something like yeah, that? Yeah, they, they, they finished second one, so the Jerry yeah. Francis era, wasn't it, in the midfield? Yeah. Um, attractive team to watch in, in a day, managed, I think, by Gordon Jago, who'd come on to yeah. then uh, in the 70s. Um, yeah, QPR, just looking at Marsh's career here, listeners, um, 211 appearances in the late 60s for, for QPR. Um, is that 100 goals? 100, 106 goals for, for Queen's Park Rangers. Then he went to Manchester City, which the Wikipedia page says was less 
successful because they were a bit of a they were kind of like a Cinderella side in the it was only in recent times. It seems strange now that they're like one of the richest clubs in football on the planet. But they were quite a Cinderella side in their time, Manchester City, always second best to Manchester United. And if they won a League Cup, they considered that like a high point of <laughs> of the decade. And um Marsh going there, I think, added probably a, a very Manchester City element in that they were good to watch at times, but not, not consistent. And then he moved to America. He would um, take his trade in the end to Tampa Bay Ray at Rowdies. Apart from that brief um, trip back for Fulham, which is the fixture that we're talking about today, Rodney Marsh. Um, and also he's become quite successful out there in business as well. I'm reading later, he's, he made his made his name and career out there after after giving up the football. So there we are. Um, Fulham two mil three for me. Neil, did you have a did you have a choice for that, for the Fulham game? I did. I've gone. Uh, I've gone for a game in the sixties. Uh, I've okay. gone for an FA Cup third round game on the 9th of January nineteen sixty five. Right. Finished Fulham three, Millwall three. So FA Cup third round. Yep. Uh, we recovered from three one down to secure ourselves a replay. We'd been knocked out by Kettering of all people. The season before, we were we were we were in Division Four, I believe, at the time, weren't we? Yeah, so we'd be Division, yeah, Division Four. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, just looking and up the, we're in the first division. They had George Cohen, obviously, about to win a World Cup. World Cup. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Bobby Robson. Yeah. Uh, Thirteen years before he demanded the, the yeah, but they cracked out the flamethrowers. <laughs> I was at that game as well. <laughs> and Johnny Haynes, who was, of course, he was the first hundred pound a week footballer. Yeah, he was a, another big name of the day, wasn't he? Um, just we looking were... at the crowd to that, that fixture, twenty one thousand at the Den for the for the. Um, oh, sorry, that was at Craven Cottage. Excuse me, that, uh, the, the the Den um, for the replay, Neil, which would be a two 0 win from your three three draw there, but the. The den would have thirty one thousand packed into it for the replay. That's incredible, isn't it? It was absolutely unbelievable. But the team we had, this team is packed. Uh, we had uh, Alex Stepney in goal. Stepney in goal. Yep. John Gilchrist. Who I think did he get an honourable mention on one of your uh, recent shows? We Scott have football? mentioned him. Yeah, we have mentioned him. And um, oh, that's yeah, the Danny Baker show a few weeks back at Blackheath, and he mentioned John Gilchrist uh, as part of one of his um, formative players when he when he first first started going, which had been around about this era. So yeah, um, Harry Cripps played Cripsy. in that game. Yeah, Dave Harper. Yeah, probably better known as the dad now of Frank Harper. Frank, the actor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Tom Wilson, yep. Ray Goff, Di Jones, yep. Jimmy Whitehouse, who scored two goals. Uh, Len Julians, Hugh Curran, who I think got an honourable mention, didn't he? In your, we've mentioned him. Yeah, another good striker of the day. Yeah, yep. and Dennis John, who's the player I've actually picked out to okay. speak a little bit about uh, Plymouth Argyle's first apprentice. But, but well, trust me, listeners, it does get better. He was actually a <laughs> member of our squad that won back-to-back promotions, but wasn't a regular. Right. But he had actually had a singing career. Did he? I didn't know that. Yeah, he did. He had a singing career that really took off when he was at Millwall, and he actually had a record deal with EMI. Wow. And he actually made several records for EMI. <laughs> You obviously haven't, yeah. You obviously haven't read my Millwall Who's Who available from Victor Publishing. Too, I've right, left, Nick? I've left it downstairs, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> this is how much prep I've done for the show, listeners. I should have brought it upstairs, but no. Yeah, well, available on Amazon and anywhere yeah. else. I recommend uh, it. He ended his career in South Africa and went on to represent South Africa in the Olympiad of Song. In Athens. <laughs> what useless nonsense. Where did you know? find this information? How do you know that? He told Great me. Stuff. Oh, he told you? He told me. He told me when I spoke to him. He died in 2013. Yeah, just seeing and that, his yeah. his son is the Welsh Rugby Union prop, Will Griffjohn. Oh, okay. Current Welsh Rugby yeah. Union prop. Bring us up to date. 
That's fantastic. This is why you should be listening to this show, listeners. There are no other contenders out there that bring you this kind of detail. And yes, I should have picked up Neil's book, and then I could sound like I know what I'm talking about too. <laughs> That's great detail there, Neil. Fantastic stuff. Wow. So that was wow. a three-all draw, and we actually missed a penalty at 2-1. Harry Cripps missed a penalty. But yeah. but you can imagine what the what the dem was like for the replay, can't you? If anybody has got a memory of that, just hit us up and tell us about it. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, well, that crowd winning 2-0... Yeah. With that team um, knocking a first division team out of the FA yeah. Cup, when you're a fourth division team, I don't think it probably happened too often back then. Thirty-one thousand. That would have been. I mean, the, the, the famous um, line about the, the Cold Blow Lane was it felt like a trap. I can't remember who said that. It was. It was. It was a quote from somebody. Thought it was like you're entering a giant trap at the end of uh, that that um, railway arch road that I used to go along to get there. Um, I mean, the biggest crowd that I ever stood in at Cold Blow Lane would be Liverpool um, in, in the first division season, which was just a few days before Hillsborough, coincidentally, um, having just watched the um, the drama about the, um, I think it's called Anne, it's on Heights, which is very good, listeners. But that was, that was packed, that had 23,000. And believe me, um, it was the only time, in fact, Neil, I've ever been in a crowd that surged you know, when the old um, they show the cop used to have that kind of wave, almost like people surge, yeah. and it was like a it moved, and that was the only time it ever happened to me. It didn't happen very often at the den, obviously. Um, but I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't. He had no control over where you went. I finished up from the back of the Cold Blow Lane end and finished up probably not very far away, but my feet came off the ground as the, uh, we scored. Danny Summer, I couldn't tell you a thing about the goal. I never saw it. It was so tightly packed. What it would be like with thirty-one thousand in there, I, I, I genuinely don't know. I mean, it would have been intense. I can't, I can't imagine it. That was I intense. Think that more in once or twice, haven't we? Didn't we'll be up to the forty thousands and the you know forty-eight thousand was famously the, uh, the, the 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 record for the ground. I mean, I suppose you're going back to the nineteen thirties for that, but this is the nineteen sixties, and I think you're right. I think we we got more than thirty thousand on that. I think the Spurs game was. Um, the, the FA Cup game, I think that was in the high 30s. Was it 36, 37,000 in the den? I, I, I can't imagine that. I mean, it, fe it felt so tight that night against Liverpool. It was what officially was 23,000. Um, I can't imagine we'd be like another 10, 15,000 people in there. Incredible. Um, but yeah, great choice. Great choice. Achtung, Mailball. But we must move along, Neil, because we've got seven fixtures of February to get through, mate. And... Um, Next up on the list is Cardiff City. Um, and I've gone for a much more recent um, fixture um, just to try and contrast. I've been, been sticking, I've found myself, I, I constantly go back to the 70s, listeners. I keep, you know, when, when you think of a fixture, you think, oh, yeah, I'm going to go back to the 70s. But I'm, I'm, I've gone with this one mostly because it just struck me what a, a, you, there are some players that you remember, Neil, and other players that are just totally bland and you don't think of them. You, you forget they even existed. And this is only in 2014. This is a 1 0 win for Mill over Cardiff City on 25th of October 2014. Um, Mill's side, David Ford, Andy Wilkinson. I'd forgotten Andy Wilkinson. I, I, if he played, he's there in the lineup. Can't remember him. Signed him on loan from Stoke or somewhere. This is where I need that book again. This is Mark Beavers, Danny Shitter, obviously both both big names. Matthew Briggs, I've forgotten the existence of two of our players there. Andy Wilkinson, and Matthew Briggs, can't remember them. Can't we picture them. From Fulham. We signed him from Fulham, I believe. Guyanese and ancestry. That's right. That's, that's, that's got the national flag there. Yes, yeah, the Guyana national flag. Um, then we've got Sean Williams, who would go on to become a great servant for the club. Lee Martin, who I saw playing the other week at Ebbsfleet for Ebbsfleet versus, um, I think it was Concord Rangers, him and, and Joe Martin. Um, he was at Dartford Dave. D Dartford Dave, I think, was, was playing non league for, was it, was it Glebe? I heard the other day. A, a VCD, oh, right, no, right. VCD Athletic in Crayford. There are too many Lee Martins and Dave Martin. Dave Martins, Joe Martin, of course, was in that Ebbsfleet yeah. game. Ed Upson, who I do remember, thankfully. Ricardo Fuller, who is forever, um, you know, recalled for the, the shot that hit the... It actually went onto the roof, didn't it, of the cold blow lane end? 
yeah. he gets unfairly maligned. I, I never thought he was that bad a player, but that's the thing that everyone remembers Ricardo uh, Fuller for because it was it actually um, went onto the roof of the Cold Blow Lane in when he missed a chance, um, which didn't endear him to the to the, the, the patrons of the Den listeners, of course. And then you got Lee Gregory, who again great servant for the club. Um, a very Millwall player in many respects, Lee, Lee Gregory, um, coming from you know the electrician's trade as he did, and then Scott McDonald, little Scott. Again, I, it, 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 I remember him. He slipped my mind completely until I saw this team lineup. And the reason I mention all those players um, is that we spend a lot of time Neil on uh, the player, the, the big moments, the incidents, and the players that you do remember. But often, the the joy of football is in the blokes you completely forgotten, right? Andy Wilkinson, I'd forgotten him completely. And there he is in that starting 11. Quite a steady and... player, I seem to remember. I think we signed him on loan from Stoke. <clears throat> I think, I think, uh, yeah, but I can't remember why. It must have been no, done I, I, or something like that. Matthew, on, the, on the bench, Tom King, who's, who's actually doing quite well for himself now in lower, lower level Division uh, 1, Division 2, uh, League 1, League 1, 2 football. Um, and Jimmy Abdu is on the bench in this game. Uh, it didn't show, and it, it wasn't substituted. Byron Webster came on for Matthew Briggs in the seventy-second minute. And Martin Walford. I always liked Martin Walford, and we he one that seemed to slip through our through our um, our fingers a little bit. He came on for Ricardo Fuller in the seventy-eighth minute. Um, so there we are. Nothing particularly outstanding about that fixture. I just thought I'd contrast the past with this, one of the strange things of age, Neil listeners. Is you can yeah, remember the past amazing more the easy and recent. It's absolutely amazing the players that you do forget. Yeah. That, yeah, that you think, oh Christ, yeah, he played yeah. for us, didn't he? Absolutely, um, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Fourteen hundred well, players, you don't remember them all, do you? Mind you, we're slagging off um, Gary Rowett for signing loads of midfielders and going nowhere. But look at this bench here. I mean, you've got Tom King in in, in goal as a substitute goalkeeper. Jimmy Abdu. Uh, Byron Webster, Richard Chaplow, and Martin Walford, midfielder is classed as there. I mean, he might have he's probably better going forwards than he was defending, but that was a defensive minded bench as well. So, anyway, yeah, we, we managed to scratch out a win that day against Cardiff. Yeah, Richard Chaplow, a player that we wish had we'd forgotten had played for us. <laughs> His standout moment was when he was playing Monopoly when he was dropped, wasn't he? <laughs> he played Monopoly. Yeah, um, Nothing like a good board know, game. I- <laughs> Yeah, then you get beat five six nil at Watford, and we got slaughtered. Meltdown with an absolute pile on. And he put a, he posted that he loved playing board games with the family. Nothing like it on Boxing Day. I think we got slaughtered at Watford, as you say, which I went down an absolute le- lead balloon online. I think that was the end of Richard Chapman as as a Millwall player, not with, with no great um, you know, sense of loss afterwards. Did you have a Cardiff game that you're going to go for, Neil? I did. I've gone for one from the 71 72 season because okay uh because i hadn't opened some post obviously not being here for a while and i came across and one of the things was your brilliant calendar oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. with me and uh so i saw that and i thought 1971 72 yeah i went for millwall one cardiff one it was okay this was when March we started 11th. to choke yeah. a little bit. Yeah, on March 11th. Yeah. This was the beginning and the end, I think. It was the second of three draws that we had. Yes, we did. Yeah. And uh, and we went 1-0 down. Alan Warboys scored after eight minutes. And then Derek Posse equalised after 56, 56. minutes. Yeah. Uh, Brian Clark played for Cardiff that day and I just made a note Brian Clark later in Millwall. Yes he was. But the match report I pulled out it's it said it said that Dunphy was on the bench and didn't come on in this game and it said that we missed him. Okay. And yet if you speak to some players from that era, Dunphy cost us promotion that season because he couldn't be bothered. Of obviously, Eamon, if you are actually listening to this and you want to put things right, get in touch and we'll gladly speak to you. He said, uh, Millwall played like uh, frigidity men, or sorry, fidgety men. Fidgety men. men okay. Afraid of making mistakes and thinking too much of the first division. Well, well, 
I mean, I, that predated my time. I, my very first game was actually a, a couple of weeks after this fixture that you picked out. Now, I, I, my first game yeah, was yeah. Portsmouth on March the 31st. So this would be uh, March the 11th. So just a couple of weeks beforehand. And as you say, three draws, uh, two all at home to Swindon, one all that we're talking about against Cardiff, and then a nil-nil at Blackpool. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard for me at this length to to form a, a, a rounded view of Dunphy because, um, you know, you, you, you're you standing on the terracing as a child, you, you just hear the kind of... A, very just you hear divisive opinions about everyone, don't you? So I can't I don't remember that much of him as a player, but um, you know, kind of the, the profiles I've read of him since describe his ability with the ball. And I think he probably was an artistic player in a in a in a in a, a side that um was Benny Fenton had us playing fairly functional football um at that point. And it, it was winning football, but we did go off the board a little bit when you look at the results at that time, and that cost us. Yeah, and I promise we haven't discussed anything of this beforehand. But no, I'm just reading the match report here, and you run. Um, you mentioned George Best and yeah. and certain oh. tackling. This guy, uh, the match report from the people, uh, said there was never any chance of this entering the files of dirty matches under strict referee Ray Tinkler. But there were three bookings for Bell, Brown and Alder for desperate fouls committed in the cause of promotion and relegation, whichever side you are on. Why can't I write like Steve Richards who wrote this? Yes. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's it, I mean, some of the some of the reportage of the time was wonderful. Some of it was quite basic, and um, some of it was very, very slanted against us. So it, it, it varies, but that's 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 beautiful prose. I love referee Ray Tinkler. Who sounds like he should be in Carry On Referee or something, shouldn't he? You know, the, yeah, Doctor Tinkler. He probably was. <laughs> I think I've seen him on the big match. He always used to have short shorts and bloody. Yeah, but the referees they used to wear the zip up tops. Zip up tops. The, the the character of characters. I mean, going totally off to a tangent on this of seventies referees was Roger Kirkpatrick, who Patrick, I've seen. Yeah, he yeah. had this kind of flamboyant um, gesture. The way we go, you know, you kind of like point at the kick off, and he had he had a very very distinctive style. Well, he was the um, Phil Dowd of the time before <laughs> Phil Dowd, and who was quite famous for his exaggerated movements and hand signals. But Roger Kirkpatrick, he was on another level, wasn't he? With his big mutton chop, yeah. mutton chop sideburns. There we are. Anyway, we are, we are digressing, listeners, as ever. Um, that's a great choice, Neil. So that's Millwall. Um, what was the result? It was three three, you said, wasn't it, Neil? No, um, one, one. one one. One each. One each. Sorry, in in nineteen. 19- 72 and one all draw uh, with Cardiff. But we must move along, Mr. Fisler. And um, we come along to Queen's Park Rangers um, now. And I've gone for a fixture from 1900, listeners, an FA Cup fixture. Um, 1900. This was played at Kensal Rise. The Rangers have been at a number of different West London locations before they finished up at Loftus Road. Kensal Rise. Which looks like a fairly substantial stadium when I've looked at um, some of the pictures of, of, of the ground. Um, but this was a win for the Lions in the FA Cup in 1900, 17th of Feb, 1900. I think we go on to make the semi finals in, in that season um, as Millwall Athletic. And this is a report from The Referee, which was a newspaper of the time specialising in, in football generally. Um, Millwall Athletic, it says, made no mistake when they engaged Queen's Park Rangers in the second round of the English Cup at Kensal Rise Saturday afternoon. A great game was expected, and this expectation might have fairly well been realised, but for the heavy going um, in the, and, and the foul tactics of both teams. Now, heavy going and foul tactics of both teams. Um, and further on... Um, it mentions again, um, the ground will have to be properly drained in future if really good football is to be played at this venue. It sounds like an absolute mud bath. Um, and then there's a, a, a second report from the same game. They used to use pseudonyms for their writers a lot. This is by an, an old ranger. And he refers to um, the mud being ankle deep. This <laughs> ankle deep. <laughs> Try and play a game of football on on that. Um, we 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 did prevail. A goal from Gettins, 
um, scoring um, five minutes before time, so 85th minute, I guess. And sure, then okay. earlier, two second half goals providing for, for the uh, the Dockers in this FA Cup tie. Um, but the, the muddy conditions really stood out for, for me because I think we were not averse to a bit of mud at the North Greenwich ground from Ivor Red Hill. That was also yeah, no, prone to flooding, it, wasn't it? Yeah, I think I think the whole... I think the whole area was built on marshland, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And so clearly um, was Kensal Rise, QPR's ground. I mean, whether that would yeah, be a factor in the moving on. Drainage, would you? Yeah, but back then, yeah, but these days they put all kinds of stuff in. And you wouldn't have had it back then. you just wait for it to dry out, wouldn't you? And if it, yeah, but if it yeah. didn't, you just got on with it. There's no such thing as a match postponed because of a muddy pit or anything no, like that. No, it had to be quite extreme for a game to be postponed. I'm mean, just trying to think back to Cold Blow Lane. My, I mean, at the start of the season, it always looked pretty good uh, as a pitch. Um, the It would wear. I think probably now there's much more emphasis on the, um, uh, what's the, what's it, like the horticultural side. I, think, I don't know if that's the right term for grass maintenance, professional sports uh, turf maintenance. Um, and the, the 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 pitch would certainly age badly across a season at, at Coldwell Lane. But it always, I can't recall many postponed games there. It had to go. It had to be a really extreme weather to to put uh, end a game at at the old den. Um, and obviously, the new ground has got heated, um, you know, cables laid under it to to prevent frosting and whatnot. But it's got all sorts laid under it, isn't it? It cost hell of a lot of money. I think when they did it, the end of or the start of last season, wasn't it? The end start of yeah. the season. I mean, I love this. This just before we close out on this, I'm just, the the prose and, and and the writing of these old reports was wonderful. So the headline is from this is from the old ranger, ankle deep in mud. He says, with a lowering sky overhead and a blatant onlooking crowd, a blatant onlooking crowd, which um, which must have obtained proportions seldom seen in this south of England, the green and white of QPR of Queens Park Rangers. Uh, loomed up on those of the dark blue of Millwall. I think that's that's the kind of writing I want to read from my journalists out there. I don't know if that's possible, but that's where we want to take it. So there we are. Did you have a QPR game, Neil? Or I did. That, um... I, yeah, this all makes sense. It's for no other reason. It was a Good Friday game, 3rd of April 1953. Yep. Finished yep. Millwall 2, QPR 1. Goal scorers were Jock Smith and Johnny Hartburn. What a name that is, Johnny right, Hartman. <laughs> and Conway Smith got QPR's goal. Okay. The middle side was Malcolm Finlayson, Alex yep. Jardine. I think I picked out another Scotsman that was in your Scottish special. We've yes, right. We've mentioned Alex Jardine before now. Yep. George Fisher, whose brother Jack Fisher. Died a f- couple of weeks ago. Was our oldest surviving player at ninety five, ninety six, I think. Very distinctive looking brothers. A very kind of high cheekbone, very dark hair, and kind of very strong brown eyes. Both of them, though, they're very distinctive. You always know the Fisher brothers in those old photos, Neil, don't you? Yeah, and they were born actually where the East Stand now sits at the Den, when it was obviously uh, when it was obviously all housing around there, right. Okay. So we had a guy called John Short, Jerry Bowler, I think it was Northern Ireland International, Alan right. Thrippleton, who okay. was actually a deaf player, was profoundly deaf. They had to wow. communicate with hand, sig- with hand signals. Ended up wow. becoming a postman, a wow. northern lad, but was that's, actually that's, deaf. And, uh, that's, that's quite something. They reckoned it affected his game quite a lot because... It, Embarrassment, or it just wasn't, it yeah. just wasn't a thing back then. As the thing was, it Johnny Johnson also played in that game. Wow. Fred Smith, one of the goal scorers. Frank Neary, who uh, former QPR player. Pat Sayward, who became a decent manager, and uh, also I think played for Aston Villa in the Cup final, didn't they? Right. Johnny Hartburn. We were third in the league at the time. Johnny uh, Hartburn. But we, <laughs> yeah, but I've left you with that one now, haven't I? When we're talking about Austin, well, like, yeah. Austin called <laughs> back back when I back when I was a, a kind of a regular member of the working population, listeners, I used to have a. a, a, a he wasn't a full ticket, this chap. So I probably I don't know if that's the right politically correct term for him, but he wasn't the full ticket. And he, his his thing was he used to write to me and call me Mister Heart Attack, like a double barrel name, Mister Heart Attack. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was meant, as, meant as, it was meant as an insult um but it was it was always made me laugh um so there he is yeah uh, 110 appearances johnny hartburn 110 appearances 30 gold 1951 50 51 season to 53 54 great players great names um good choice of fixture mate thank you for that um so next up after the qpr we're playing it's a relentless month, listeners. Blimey, I keep, I keep thinking those must be the last one now, but it's not. It's Next up is Blackburn, Blackburn Rovers. And I've gone for a game um, from 1979. Notable, because it was an FA Cup game, Neil. Um, we'd, we'd actually drawn Blackburn Rovers at home, but we had to play it at Ewood Park because the den was under a, a closure order from the FA. Uh, due to the the unfortunate incident of the odd riot that happened in the Ipswich Town quarterfinals on in front of BBC TV cameras, there's a there's you, a you there's... we're actually linking all of these things together because we mentioned the flamethrower with Bobby Robson, <laughs> and I said we have not spoken about these fixtures. I know you said no, 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 we don't pick the same games out. Well, it's half the fun is, is springy on each other, I think. So you can whatever comes into your head is, is the entertainment for the listeners out there. Um, this would finish. So it does link in with Ali, uh, with um, Bobby Robson. You're right, actually. Um, because of the incidents in 1978, a game I was at, I, I often find myself saying, yeah, I was at that game, like I'm some kind of face. I was in there organising all these these situations. And I wasn't. I'm, I've been, led a peaceful life, but um, I was there at the, 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 at the Ipswich riot. Um, I was there at the Luton riot. I was there in 2002. Um, You're probably there at the Birmingham riot as well, weren't you? Right, right. You've been at all the riots, Nick. <laughs> he says he's peaceful, but he's there organising it. I know that's what people are saying at home. Um, this finished 2 1 to Blackburn, played at Ewood Park, despite it being a, a drawn as, as a mill home fixture. Um, unlucky, apparently. We're unlucky in this game. Uh, we exited the cup. 79, uh, 78-79 season, which is a difficult season. I think that was under Jules Petchy's management, if memory serves. Um, we uh, we had a, we went close through, um, I think, Tony Towner, great winger, Tony Towner on the wing. Um, later, we would have, um, would have equalised. Blackburn had John Radford, who I think, Neil, if that's the same John Radford has played for Arsenal in their double winning side, I think he was a... A striker with with uh, with Arsenal in, in the early seventies, I think. Anyway, um, Phil Walker scored for the Lions. Sadly, not enough up there in in Lancashire, Blackburn, Lancashire. Pat Cuff, who was much berated, listeners, and I think I may have joined in this um, hounding of Pat Cuff as the worst goalkeeper of all time. Um, and we've looked at this a couple of times, and I don't think his numbers were actually as bad as memory memory serves. But he's mentioned here. Um, as making um, a miraculous save. Um, Rovers have been desperately close on so many occasions, with Cuff, Pat Cuff, miraculously scooping a pull round effort off the line, um, which just goes to show that it's your memory is um, is a construction, not necessarily the truth. So there we are. Maybe you spending too much time with Neil Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, well, Neil's one of these uh, guys that produces statistics to disprove your memory, you know, <laughs> which is always a problem. <laughs> I, I prefer the fantasy. Was it? They said write the story, not the facts, you know. Um, so yeah, miracle save from Pat Cuff there at, uh, at Blackburn, and a loss that should have been played at the Den, but was played at Ewood Park. Ewood Park. I don't even know how you pronounce that. So yeah, Blackburn. Did you have a Blackburn fixture, Neil? Or? I do. I've picked you out. Do. Uh, okay. I've just had a very quick look because obviously okay. I'm totally ill prepared for this as always. Well, I, I always have that hopeful tone in my voice, uh, listeners, because Neil said to me he, he hadn't got all the fixtures covered. So I, everyone now, I'm wondering it's lucky dip time. Is this the one where Neil runs out of fixtures? And I say, oh, that's hence the hopeful <laughs> upward questioning swing of my thing. You've got a fixture, Neil? I've actually bloody lost it. So we'll have to come back to it. I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to it. <laughs> I'll find it. I'll, you're going to have to cut this bit out, yeah? Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Right, the fixture I've got, Nick, is from the 7th of September, 1968. Right. And it was Blackburn Rovers 2, Millwall 4. And uh, we came back from 2-0 down to win this particular game. Okay. Uh, Don Martin scored two goals for Blackburn Rovers in the first 17 minutes. 
Then Ken Jones pulled one back for us after 42 minutes. Yep. Good old Harry then scored two, Mr. Cripps. Probably probably actually the only time in his career that he ever scored two goals in a game. <laughs> after 63 and then 88. So that put Make us... Up, yeah. Three, three to eight, yeah. Yeah. And then Keith Weller scored almost a kick kickoff. That was the 9,923 people. Great, one... great Liverpool team. I know, yeah, but I never keep on saying great, but there's somebody in here that I'd forgotten that actually played for us. And I've written well, a book was... on that. Uh, okay. The, the, the side was Brian King, John Gill, Chris, Harry Cripps, Ken Jones, Barry Kitchener, Dennis Burnett, Derek Posse, Keith Weller, mm. Brian Conlon was the player that I'd forgotten had played for us. Okay. I think he came to us on loan from somewhere like Oxford or somewhere like that. George Jacks, Billy Neal, and Mr. Dunphy came off the bench in this game. I just the, mercurial, the mercurial Mr. Dunphy. If, if you were to ask me if there's one player I'd love to have seen, because I, it, I started going in 72, as I think I've said many, many times that. Um, but if I could pick one player I would love to have seen, it would have been Keith Weller in a Millwall shirt, Neil. Um, everything I've read about him says what a silky, skillful midfielder man. Again, possibly another player that never fulfilled his potential. He finished up at, um, I think he played for, for Leicester after us. And I think he also went to America like so many um, professionals d- did at that time, especially from what you might call the, 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 the kind of more artistic side of the game. And, and, and Weller was a skillful player. Um, and I just wish it'd be one of those players I wish I'd seen. I've never seen, I, it predated me, so I never saw him. But if I could have a wish, it'd be Keith Weller as a, as a, as a Millwall player. Just very quickly looked up Brian Conlon in, in the Millwall Who's Who, uh, available from Victor On Publishing. And Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> And it's going to pay my mortgage. And we will uh, still we'll put a link in it. Don't worry. We'll put a link in the show when it goes out. Uh, Brian Conlon, we actually paid £15,000 from Darlington in November Darlington. 67. Darlington. He scored on his debut against Crystal Palace in an away game in November 1967, month, oh. a year before I was born. Uh, and he only really spent a year at the club. He, 13 goals in 45 games and we shipped him off to Norwich City, uh, became a milkman and died after a long illness aged 57. So That's no no great age, is it? 57, wow. No, wow. no. Couldn't have fitted in with Benny's, Benny's master plan that would come to fruition in 71, 72, ultimately. Um, a, a name I don't know. I mean, but Conlon is not a name that I know. But interesting, talking about Darlington, it was when I was um, went to the Middlesbrough game um, a few months ago. Now, I actually drove past the the Darlington Stadium that almost well, it did finish the club off, didn't it? it bankrupted them as a club. There's, it did. It did. I think it's uh, now a rugby ground or something. It's a rugby union ground. I can't remember the name of the the, the rugby union side. It's on the side of the stadium as you go past. Oldham Park, I believe. Nice, nice looking ground. Nice looking stadium. Um, and I think Darlington, I think it may have been reformed as a Phoenix club playing through the local leagues now, but it actually bankrupted Darlington FC. But the stadium um, lives on, as, as you say, they were a rugby union, rugby union ground. Now. So, yeah, I drove past it on the way into onto Middlesbrough a few weeks back. Just as a total aside, this is the kind of thing you listen to this show for, listeners. Um, that's a great choice there, Neil. So we move along. We move along from Blackburn. We next have... As I flip my iPad up, we've got Derby County um, in this torrent of fixtures, seven fixtures in February. Um, I don't think of podcasters when they, they carve all these fixtures out. Do I? But yeah, no, they try, to, don't think of me and you trying to do a fixture trying show. To do something, <laughs> trying to do something vaguely interesting for the listeners out there. But anyway, there we are. I've gone from one from 2012, another more recent fixture. Um, a win for Mill 2 1 over Derby County, 10th of November 2012. Um, and the reason that I've gone for it really is that I saw playing for Derby, um, was one Theo Robinson who signed for us briefly and then signed, he, he was sold almost as quickly as he seemed to play for us. I, th- I don't think he made barely any, any, any appearances at all. Actually, I'm gonna have a quick look at him as I'm talking. So I did my, my prep ran out for this this show listeners at a certain point, but I'm just gonna look and see at 
Theo Robbins. One thing I do remember is he, I, I, I did a selfie. He was wearing a really shiny silver suit. Like, um, it was almost like Baco foil, this suit he was wearing. He parked in the Den car park shortly after his, um, he'd signed for us. And I, I, I said, Theo, Theo, Theo. And I took a picture of myself with Theo wearing this bright, silky uh, suit. Eight appearances, three as a substitute. And he scored three goals. What a bad striker, really. I thought he was quite a decent signing, but he just didn't. It just didn't happen for him at the end, did it? He could, must have fallen foul of the manager, which would have been Kenny, I think, at that point. Yeah, I think it was Kenny. I think I'd love to get to the bottom of what happened with him one day because it was almost like one minute he was here, one minute he wasn't. And Yeah, quite literally. I mean, we signed him for a reported or thought to be reported, whatever way you want to put it, 300000 which is no... You know, it's, it's no no mean sum of money at the den. You don't we don't spend anything as we can help it as we can see right now. You know, um, and then he was gone also for three hundred thousand to to Derby, um, and that was the last we saw of him. But um, I, I thought he was a pretty good player, and when when we signed him, I was I was well pleased. Fast, quick, pacey forward, but he must have fallen foul of Kenny Jacket. That's all about all I can think of. Mill line up that day in that two one win over Derby, the great David Ford in goal, Shane Lowry. Who's um whose goal at Cholton gets run every now and again on on the uh, on on social media? Adam Smith, I forgot he played for us. Adam Smith, Mark Beavers, Danny Shitu, Jimmy Abdu, who um, recently, very unluckily, with the Comoros, went out of the African Nations Cup at the age of thirty-seven, sent off in five minutes. <laughs> very memorable. Um, Liam Feeney, remember Liam Feeney? Neil, he was um, another high-profile winger, wasn't he? At one point, Chris Taylor. Liam Trotter, Andy Keogh, and Chris Wood, who would go on to fame and fortune in the Premier League, and not us, despite us. I think we're ready to pawn the family silver to, to get his signature, but he didn't sign for us. Um, on the bench, we had Mark, Mike Taylor, um, Jack Smith, Scott Malone, Carly Osborne that day, and Sean Batts. Otherwise, an unremarkable fixture for us, but there we are. Mill 2, Derby 1 from 2012. And I've picked one out from 2004. Okay, let's have a look Very at quickly, it was, uh, it was a Christmas game. It was Tuesday the 28th of February. Yeah. Sorry, of December. February, where did I get February from? 20, 28th of December, 2004, at Pride Park. Finished Derby County nil, Millwall 3. And yes, Barry it is. Barry Hales hat trick. Barrington Hales. Great. I, I like Barry Hales. Good player. I did. I thought he was a fantastic little player. Uh, he'd been around the, we've been around the, the track a few times, hasn't he? Yeah. yeah. He scored goals everywhere. And I can remember going to Pride Park for this game, thinking probably a draw was the best that we were going to get. Yeah. And we absolutely smashed them off the park. We really did. It, 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 it was one of those memorable Millwall away days. Just looking look at the lineup. Recently with some... Fondness, yeah, the lineup, decent side. Andy Marshall in goal, yeah. Kevin Muscat, Muscat. Uh, what we would give for Kevin Muscat in our team right now, Neil? I would, uh, I'd pawn everything I've got for Kevin Muscat to come back in in, the, in his heyday. Yeah, some people want him as manager. So <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, David Livermore, Jody Morris, yes, yeah. yep, Matt Lawrence, Mark yep, Mark Phillips. Happy birthday. I think it Absolutely. was birthday a couple of days ago. Yep. Uh, Dennis Wise was the player manager. Dennis Wise, I saw him um, having a. Dennis Wise was at the Vatican. He had, I don't know how Dennis Wise finishes up at the Vatican. Maybe he's a Catholic. I don't know. But uh, with a selfie, selfie featuring the Pope, who looked the Pope looked quite disgruntled at being in Wise's mo- mobile phone shot. <laughs> but anyway, I've, I've got off on a tangent. I've interrupted your flow there, mate. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Adrian Siriu, do you remember him? I do, the long throw, man, yeah. Him of the long throw that caused <laughs> havoc. At, Briefly. Against Leicester, wasn't it? And Leicester That's scored, right. And he set up the only goal of an awful game. That's right. Marvin Elliott, decent midfielder. Good player, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Danny Dicchio, who, Dicchio. I, who I thought did us quite good service as well, actually. He did, he did, yeah, yeah. Barry Hales and Peter Sweeney. Peter Sweeney, I like Peter Sweeney, but he was a, a kind of a uh, the kind of player that I think managers would probably pull their hair out with because he was quite inconsistent. When he was good, he was very good. And when he was bad, he was horrid, wasn't he? 
Yeah, and the Derby side, one of their substitutes was was Mr. Baroness Brady, Paul Pesky Salida. Pesky Salida, or whatever you pronounce his name. Mm. Good choice. I like that choice. Some good players in there. It's, 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 it, that's quite a lineup. I mean, you know, at the moment, we the, the complaint of any Mill fan at the moment is that we have no passion. That was a side that was, you know, what wise Muscat. <laughs> <laughs> Jody we, Morris. He, he didn't do much of us, Morris, but um, you know, the certainly um DKO, I mean these were these were one hundred percenters and um I I, I always like watching that, that side. Good choice, Neil. So we come to the final fixture of February, which is Sheffield United. And I've picked out a fixture from nineteen thirty nine just purely because um any fixture from 1939 always seems quite poignant because um, just a few months later, football will be the least of the country's worries. But this was a 4-0 win for the Lions at Cold Blow Lane. Um, and I just, I suppose it just, you get a sense of what the club was trying to move towards prior to the outbreak. of Well, we've said it a few times. I won't flog the point, Neil, but the club was planning for um, an assault on the first division. This was this was the plan for for the, for the club under Charlie Hewitt, and you get a sense of what would possibly or never would happen, but would possibly could have been as Millwall slammed four past league leading Sheffield United, and this is a report from the Sunday Pictorial, which I think is the Sunday Mirror. Um, Mill four Sheffield United nil. A brilliant display by Millwall kept thirty thousand fans nil roaring at the Den yesterday. And there'll be a sound re- reason for sore throats around New Cross Way today. I guess that's um, alluding to having a few beers after the game. Millwall would have met the Masters in every phase of the game. Sheffield cannot hold their midweek game as an alibi. They had a midweek fixture. They were outplayed by a vastly superior team and in front of 30,000. And although league-wise, I think we weren't particularly... Um, doing well this particular season, you do get a sense that this was a side that had the potential to fire its way to the, the next level of English football, first division football, but for a certain Austrian dictator all the way over there in, in Berlin. Um, 4-0 win for the Lions, 1939. I always find it quite poignant because, you know, the world would change within a few months and that would be that. But um, just gives you a sense of what could have been. You have a decent side. Duncan Uly in goal again. Isaac Lee, Ted Smith, Tom Brolly, Ted Chiverton, Jimmy Forsyth. Fred Fisher, who scored two goals, was yeah. killed in action in World War Two. I think he was our own... Uh, I think we had two players killed in World War Two, And he was one of them, was killed. I think he was a flying observer, went up in an aeroplane and got shot down over France somewhere. Wow. Well, Jimmy Richardson scored a goal. John McLeod or or McLeod, uh, Don Barker scored one, and Red Smith. So, so, and and we were building. People might say, "Well, we haven't heard of Arthur, but we were building. There was money in the club. We'd started to spend money on players. Yep, and the ambition was there. I think we just started to improve the den as well. I think they constructed a. Bigger version of the the old seated stand. Those those of us that remember it, I think it was a bigger, <clears throat> more kind of grand version of that. And as you say, they'd invested both in playing staff and in the ground. Um, I always remember there's a, there's a team photograph from the I think it might be the season before 38, 37, might be 38, 39, But the the team photo is a large group of players with a kind of um like a commissionaire type figure. So there's like a, a bellboy, like a hotel. You know, they had like a commissionaire. Bellboys, this is they were trying to. Um, I, th- I think you got to put this down to Charlie Hewitt, who had ambitions to um turn football into an entertainment as he saw it. I mean, the the the, the, the shirts that had a kind of a sheen to them. This was a this was a much an attempt to take Mill down a kind of a, what you might call a, a, a classier, glossier look, um, and route generally, I think. Gentrifiers, um, I think. Gentrifiers. <laughs> and it took Adolf Hitler to stop them. Um, Lions would finish 13th in this final season of full league football, 38-39. Um, but as you say, you're right, Neil, this was this was building for the future. A future, unfortunately, would um, be shattered by, by the onslaught that would come within a, a year or two. Sheffield United would finish second and get promoted. 
that season to, to the top flight, which the following season, I think a, a couple of games took place before war was declared, and then that would be that until post-war, 1946-47 onwards. Um, but there we are, 4-0 win over Sheffield United. Did you have a, a fixture for the Sheffield, Neil? No, I think uh, yeah, I think we've bored everyone quite enough after an hour and six minutes, haven't we? I think we probably have, mate. Yeah, we've all waffled about what could have been all those years ago, but for the bombs. Um, great stuff. Neil, I want to thank you for, and welcome you back, mate. It's great to have you back on the show. I do enjoy these, these nostalgic trips down the highways and byways of wherever we go with it. So great to see you back and good. And you, you're looking well. So big welcome back to Neil Fissler and um, big thank you to you two listeners for, for tuning in. Do buy yourself Neil's book. So stop him mentioning it all the time. Mill who's who. It's on Victor Publishing co.uk it's a fantastic work um I, I mean there's no exaggeration when i say i put it in the same category as lines of the south it's, it's a definitive book well worth um 20 pounds of anyone's money uh you can get it on amazon i think too neil can't you from, yeah you can, i think you can order it in one or two other places but we've actually got uh, the great thing about being in hospital is you've got nothing to do so i've actually produced a long list of history shows which i think nick and myself are going to plow through at some stage some quite interesting we ones and we'll be having ideas all the time that's great stuff mate i really appreciate your time Neil. good to see you again mate all the best brilliant thank you thank you for listening to ask and Neil. if you enjoyed the show please head over to apple podcast and leave us a cheeky little review however do you know till next time who do you want to watch? <laughs>